to. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for being here this morning. We definitely appreciate that. Uh, our speaker this morning in India is known as the DevOps Barbie of the Netherlands. Yes, and actually she comes, she comes from a town near uh, Leiden in the train station. You have a big wall with pictures of famous and influential people from Leiden, and there is a spot reserved for her. So she is going here to give us all her knowledge and all her energy as well. She'll be discussing um, extensions and the extension ecosystem in Postgres in her talk, supporting extensions, but for real this time. So please give a warm welcome for Floor Dries. Well, I, I don't know about all of the energy because we had karaoke last night, so I don't know how much is left, but we'll, we'll, see, we'll see about that. Um, so, uh, Korea Tit, that you can see here uh, down, down, the, down my title, uh, is a sculpted female structure uh, that is serving as a architectural support, uh, taking the place of a column or a pillar, uh, supporting a structure on our head. Uh, there is a male version of that as well, but it only got introduced much later. Hmm. Guess, I don't know why. Um, this is also only going to be my, 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 my single only reference to Greek architecture. Uh, I'm sorry if that's uh, what you came for. Um, so whenever I talk to people that are not in the Postgres uh, ecosystem and they ask me, uh, you know, like, why do you do the job that you do? Why are you so involved in the Postgres community? Uh, I tell them the following. I think that Postgres is an incredibly interesting project. Uh, I've worked in open source for uh, a really long time, uh, but it's been a while that I've, uh, since I've worked on a project that is not centralized on GitHub um, and that doesn't organize on GitHub. Um, it's the most popular database in the world. I don't need to tell you this, but again, I'm telling this to someone who asks me why I work in Postgres. Um, second year in a row overtaking MySQL, even though a lot of companies, of course, uh, still rely very much on MySQL. Uh, the project is incredibly mature, right? We know that. Uh, several big companies, including the big clouds, have people on the payroll that work full-time uh, on the core project. Um, they spend the majority of their day, uh, you know, contributing to the core project. Um, I think that one thing that really, really contributes to the success of Postgres is its extensibility. Uh, Postgres doesn't need to be huge and have all of the functionality. Uh, you can stick on functionality to Postgres uh, by using extensions. I think that's incredibly interesting. That's what I tell people again. Um, but uh, what I also tell them is that the extension and tooling landscape is not as mature as Postgres is, and it doesn't get near the same as support uh, as Core does. Uh, auxiliary projects live in somewhat of a wild, wild west, uh, I think, and, it, and it's actually kind of uh, kind of a problem. Uh, it's a good thing then that I really, really like problems. So who am I? Uh, well, uh, apparently, uh, you know, DevOps Barbie from the Netherlands. Uh, but uh, also, my name is Floor. I'm yeah, I am from the Netherlands. I'm uh, head of education at uh, Tembo. Uh, we offer managed spiked. Postgres, and if you're curious what that means, uh, we still have our booth outside, so definitely come say hi in the break afterwards. Uh, before, I worked in community and developer relations roles at Ivan, at Grafana Labs, at Microsoft. Um, I'm a member of the DevOps Days uh, core team, and that means that I, that I help teams worldwide organize their DevOps Days events. Uh, I myself organized DevOps Days Amsterdam, and a month ago uh, with a wonderful team, and I see a couple of people uh, from the PG Day Lowlands team, we organized the first PG Day in the Netherlands in Amsterdam. Um, we're getting together actually next week to decide uh, which city we want to organize the next year's event in. Um, which is not going to be Amsterdam, which I'm excited about. Uh, I'm a member of the Postgres Code of Conduct Committee uh, and also uh, a karaoke enthusiast. Uh, I see actually some people that were at karaoke uh, last night, so you know, props to you for getting up early uh, to come and see me. All right. So I said that I've been open, in open source for a while. Uh, that means that I have experience with the extensibility of a software being its strength, uh, mostly coming from uh, the Ruby and uh, Rails community. Um, many language communities have their uh, package managers, right, like uh, JVM, uh, NPM, uh, plugins, gems, uh, and all of these ecosystems have very similar problems as well. 
uh, or challenges. We don't call them problems, we call them challenges. Um, dependencies maintained by the proverbial single individual in Nebraska, right? Uh, there's a lack of doc documentation, uh, there's infrequent security patches, maybe uh, malicious actors that are trying to take over a bit of software. Um, all these problems, or sorry, ch challenges you'll find, you'll find everywhere. So joining uh, Tembo in July this year, uh, I have ramped up on my knowledge of the lar larger Postgres ecosystem in particular, uh, in no small part to uh, my colleague uh, David Wheeler's uh, State of the Postgres Extensions Ecosystem or Extension Ecosystem Mini Summit series uh, on YouTube. If you haven't seen it, definitely recommend checking it out. Uh, but now I want to look at the Postgres uh, challenges from uh, sort of like a broader perspective again. Um, so zooming way, way out, uh, for several years now I've talked about open source uh, software being an educated risk that we're all very, very willing to take. Uh, open source is the foundation of any successful company, it's a driver of innovation, but it's no free lunch. Uh, just for, until now the wrong people, or like the, the wrong people bore the cost of, uh, of the uh, not free lunch, but I'll come back to that. Uh, summarizing my, uh, my very frequent rants, uh, is that open source is being funded for only a small portion of its value. Uh, open source is reliant on uh, other people's <coughs> continued work, uh, and we all operate on the assumption that stuff is that is available to us today will be available indefinitely. All right, so uh, coming from the Ruby or Rails community, uh, of course, very, very heavy user of RubyGems, which is the package manager uh, for the Ruby programming language. Um, that ships uh, since uh, Ruby uh, 1.9, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, Ruby Gems is the way for any Ruby developer to discover and install gems. Uh, you, without thinking about it really, bundle install your active red records, your Redis, your um, uh, RSpec, your uh, Capybara, your Minimagic. Uh, you, don't, you don't really think about it because it gives you a sort of like a commercial edge. You can get started right, real quick, right? It's, it's incredibly convenient. Um, and, I, and I talk about Ruby, but actually, 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 I started web development using PHP. Um, uh, I didn't know it at the time that I was using PHP because, uh, you know, I was an art school student and I had a blog and I just wanted to make sure that the blog did what I wanted it to do. Um, so I would open up the editor and, like, delete some stuff from, from plugins and from templates, uh, you know, saving and seeing if that did what I wanted it to do. Um, so I, I really did start with, with PHP in a way. Um, and similar to Ruby and to Rails, uh, setting up a WordPress project, you use a lot of uh, functionality uh, because you want to optimize for speed, right? You want to get some functionality real, real quick without having to write anything yourself. Um, so WordPress uh, has a, a lot of plugins. I think that uh, WordPress.org has the most complete collection with 60,000 uh, plugins. Uh, some of them are free, uh, some of them are paid, uh, most of them are developed by the community. Um, WordPress technology, of course, is open source and it's free and it powers a huge chunk uh, of the internet. I read like 43% of websites one run on uh, WordPress, uh, whether that's uh, WordPress.com, WordPress.org, or a hosted solution. Um, and a guy called Matt Mullenweg runs uh, Automatic, which is spelled that way with the two T's because of his first name. Um, sure, it's his company. Um, he owns WordPress.com, uh, right? And WordPress uh, sells a self-hosted version of uh, open source WordPress. Um, and then WordPress.org hosts the open source project. Then there is the WordPress Foundation, which is a 501c3 nonprofit that does not fall under Automatic's uh, ownership, but exists as a sort of like a charitable organization uh, that is dedicated to furthering the, uh, the WordPress open source project. Uh, and that also includes like forging some partnerships with companies that uh, have a WordPress offering of some sort. Um, so I already said like uh, Matt Mullenweg uh, uh, runs Automatic, that means that he also owns WordPress.com, he's also the chairman of uh, the foundation, which is a bit weird, uh, I think, uh, if the open source project lives there. All right, so now today, and I'm sure this doesn't come as news to a lot of people that are uh, spend some of their time on social media, uh, there's quite a bit of uh, drama going on uh, on, uh, on Twitter and other social media. 
uh, because Mulawek wrote a blog post in September criticizing companies that, uh, and I quote, treat open source simply as a resource to extract from its natural surroundings, like oil from the ground. Um, he mentioned GoDaddy and Google in that regard, but he went further and really picked on WP Engine specifically, uh, which is a WordPress hosting company, calling them a cancer to WordPress. Now, we have had another executive uh, several years back uh, calling Linux a cancer, if, uh, if you will remember. Mm. He also called out WP Engine's investor, Silver Lake, at a recent WordCamp, uh, which is like um, WordPress's uh, PGConf, if you will, uh, and said that uh, Silver Lake, uh, Silver Lake's companies, and specifically WP Engine, don't contribute back enough to the WordPress project, um, right? Uh, and also says that uh, the use of the WP brand sort of like uh, signals that uh, WP Engine is part of WordPress. Um, so they, they, he says that it's a, it's a very confusing thing. So on the uh, contributing thing, thank you so much. Uh, was too much singing, I guess. Uh, the automatic team contributes about 4,000 hours uh, a week to the open source uh, WordPress project. Uh, WP Engine uh, contributes 40 hours a week, so that's one person uh, probably. Um, but then again, it, it's not specified in the WordPress li uh, license that you need to contribute back to the project. So um, they have 40 hours where they don't even need to have that 40 hours really. Uh, there's no requirement, right, for them to do so. Um, so in, in reply to uh, Mullenweg's uh, not so nice words, um, WP Engine sends a, a cease and desist letter to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, Mullenweg and Automatic uh, claiming that Mullenweg had said, uh, and again I, 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 I quote, uh, he would take a scorched earth nuclear approach against WP Engine unless they pay significant fees uh, to, uh, to pay off the license uh, so that they can use the WordPress uh, trademark. In response, of course, Automatic sent their own cease and desist letter uh, saying that they have breached uh, WordPress uh, trademark usage rules. Um, now, WP Engine, uh, again, it's not, it's not a community uh, project by, by, by any means, right? Like they have extracted a lot of money, uh, of course, doing hosting, uh, hosted WordPress. Um, and they never donated to the WordPress Foundation. But I mean, if, if your, your arch nemesis is on the board of, the, of that foundation, maybe uh, it, it doesn't seem the right cause for you either. All right, so later, because this continued and continued, and believe me, I've followed this with popcorn, um, Mulawake banned a WP Engine from accessing resources of WordPress.org, uh, broke a lot of websites, uh, preventing anyone from, uh, from updating their plugins and themes, uh, also leaving companies open to security attacks as well. Uh, WP Engine, of course, said uh, Mulawake has misused its control of WordPress uh, to interfere with uh, uh, their customers' access to the, to the tool. Um, there was a new wonderful uh, checkbox, I don't know how, how well you can see it on the slide, uh, edit where uh, anyone who wanted to, uh, to access needed to verify that they're not associated with the WP Engine uh, in any way. Uh, of course, this move was uh, heavily criticized by community members uh, saying that they were banned from the community Slack uh, when they uh, either did check the, the checkbox or if they complained about the checkbox. Um, in yet another move, because it keeps on piling on, uh, WordPress.org took control of the Advanced Custom Fields plugin, which a lot of websites use because it brings very, very basic functionality. Um, uh, they, took, they, they took control of that, and that plugin was in very active development, uh, and it was forcibly taken away, and that's the first time something like that happened in 21 years of uh, WordPress existence. Pretty bizarre. Um, of course, fans on either side jump to their uh, their their uh, heroes' uh, uh, support. They 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 go to Twitter to say their bit, um, and WordPress reposts a lot of uh, the the official WordPress uh, accounts reposts a lot of their supporters as well, um, and some of them are absolutely terrible takes. So uh, this one sort of basically says that uh, WordPress will win because it locks you in. Uh, and I thought that Matt Mullenweg was on the open source train, so I don't really understand what's happening here. 
Anyway, summarizing, uh, WordPress is pretty boring technology, right? Like there's not a lot of head headlines normally around the WordPress project. Uh, and it brings to mind another pretty boring technology, honestly. Uh, and boring technology is, is you know, that's not, a, that's not a bad thing. It's sort of like sign or signals that something is reliable and it's gonna be uh, sticking around there. Uh, but now this makes me wonder, is that really the case for, for our little project as well? Um, the whole uh, thing, of course, cracks open a public debate, pretty public debate, uh, surrounding how uh, you know, profit-driven companies can and cannot use open source software, and if, whether or not they are uh, obligated to contribute back to the projects that they use. Hmm. So here, uh, you know, Matt took it up himself to define what open source means. Uh, uh, to him uh, and what companies uh, should do despite what the license really says. Uh, but then of course there's also companies that will uh, change how permissive their stuff is um, uh, in time. So um, as a couple of examples on the slides, uh, March 20 uh, this year, Redis changed uh, its license so that future versions of Redis uh, will be released with a source available license only, uh, starting with Redis 7.4. Uh, Redis is dual licensed under the Redis source available license uh, and the server side public license, the SSPL. Uh, under the new license, cloud service providers uh, hosting Redis offerings uh, are no longer permitted to uh, use the source code um, free of charge, and they need to pay a fee so that they can use Redis 7.4 and up. Um, in March 28th, uh, the Linux Foundation uh, announced that they're supporting or bringing uh, Valky uh, to life. Uh, that's, re that's really the fastest that the Linux Foundation ever jumped to uh, uh, adopting a tool ever. Uh, there's a couple of industry participants that are heavily involved, including AWS, uh, Google Cloud, Oracle, Ericsson, Snap. Um, they're, all, they're all supporting Valky. A couple of days before that, the first commit already took place in the Valky uh, repository, which was basically a, a direct fork of Redis, right? Um, and then uh, they've been following the Redis um, uh, semantic versioning afterwards. Um, the first major version of Valky uh, 8 uh, got published uh, September 16th, so just a little bit ago. All right. That's one, that's one example. Then, uh, of course, uh, maybe, maybe more uh, familiar here, uh, Elastic. When Elastic announced that they uh, were uh, going to change their license in January 2021 uh, through a blog post that was hilariously called uh, Doubling Down on Open, uh, a shockwave went through the community, right? Like uh, in Elastic 2.0, there is clauses that prevent you, uh, to, uh, that prevent hosted or managed services from uh, using Elastic. Um, it's very copyleft style, if you know what that means, uh, like, like an SSBL type li license, and prevents third parties from obscuring trademark notices uh, and branding and can embed license keys to uh, prevent circumvention, which is very much not an open source thing, as you all know. Um, so Elasticsearch, uh, Kibana, and other projects got removed from hosted infrastructure, uh, for infrastructures, so uh, like Azure. Uh, for instance, and AWS, which was uh, really kind of the point because Elastic felt that they were eating their lunch. Um, and several players eventually decided to fork the project and call it uh, OpenSearch, uh, AWS, and my former employer, Ivan, being one of those. Um, so was very involved in that project too. Um, but then August 28th of this year, surprise, Elasticsearch is open source again. Wow, super cool. Uh, I think, I, I guess it wasn't really working out for them then. Um, and from their press release, it says that uh, we'll be adding uh, AGPL as another license option next to Elasticsearch, uh, or the Elastic uh, license and the SSPL. Um, we never stop believing and behaving like an open source community after we change the license, but being able to use the term open source by using AGPL, uh, an OSI approved license, removes any questions, fear, uncertainty, or doubt that people might have. Now, unpacking some of those acronyms, uh, AGPL is the uh, Fair Public License. Um, C the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, is not a big fan of this license and usually tells companies to uh, either switch to an alternative uh, project or to pin the version that they're using to the version before the license change. So they're, they're really not big fans of this, this license. It's, it is copy lefty. Uh, and then OSI is the uh, open source initiatives. They're the stewards of the open source uh, definition, uh, and uh, you're either, you either have a, a, an open source license or a, a license that's approved by the open source initiative or not, right? 
Um, in any case, uh, it took them a while, right, to, to sort of like change back and become open source again. And in the meantime, most of us has, have found alternatives, uh, maybe for ATB for, for you. Okay, last, uh, last example, but I can, I can continue to pile on and pile on because this has been happening uh, over and over again. Uh, Open Tofu is a Terraform uh, fork, uh, which is uh, HashiCorp uh, technology. Uh, it's a drop-in replacement for, for Terraform uh, 1.6 uh, and is uh, fully backward compatible as well. Uh, it emerged as the uh, sort of like community response to uh, HashiCorp changing their license from uh, uh, Mozilla public license to, the, to a business source license. Um, and became a Linux Foundation project, surprise, there they are again, uh, in September of the same year as well. Um, there was a suggestion for a little bit that HashiCorp, because there was so much public outrage about this, would sort of like walk back this decision, and, uh, and, and uh, if they would do so, that they would need to put Terraform in a foundation immediately uh, to sort of like gain, gain back a little bit of trust. Of course, that, that never happened. And then IBM took over HashiCorp, and then a lot of people were like, oh, maybe IBM will uh, make sure that, uh, that uh, Terraform is uh, open source again. But of course, uh, that took place in April, and nothing has happened since. Uh, just to say that license rug pooling is an actual problem as well that we see in open source. I'm gonna bring you more bad news. I feel like this, this slot in the, in the early morning is maybe not the best to just be like, oh, there's all of these issues, babes. Um, all right, so uh, while all, all companies uh, rely on a, a lot of open source, very little uh, funding is trickling down, uh, very little money is making it to maintainers. Uh, most maintainers are absolutely uh, unable to financially support their work unless their uh, company pays them to do the work, right? 44% uh, of maintainers are solo maintainers, according to a tight lift uh, survey uh, in 2023. 58% uh, of maintainers have considered quitting their project, and then 22% uh, have actually quit maintaining their, their project. Uh, that is pretty problematic, especially when they're solo maintainers. Um, and, and sort of like countering a very popular theory that uh, open source maintainers or open source people don't want to be paid for their work because that makes them more... Uh, uh, hardcore or whatever, uh, that, is, that is actually not true. 77% uh, of maintainers uh, indicated that they would very much prefer to be paid for their open source work. Um, vast majority of non-core Postgres extensions and tools are uh, controlled uh, and maintained by uh, individuals or by, uh, by companies. Uh, and especially if it's a one company that's sort of like single vendor um, raises some issues as well, right? Um, you can ask questions of, uh, of, of ownership. Uh, who, main who maintains uh, the thing? Uh, what happens if an author can no longer uh, maintain the project for, for whatever reason, right? Uh, what happens if uh, a maintainer switches company? Who owns the copyrights to an extension? Does that go with them? Does it stay with the company? Uh, does the company have any resources to make sure that that, main that extension get gets picked up and further developed. Um, uh, you also see that uh, a lot of whenever uh, companies are trying to add some functionality to their, to their offering, uh, rather than uh, do a little bit of due diligence and see what's already out there, uh, join maybe an existing project, uh, they want their extension to come out on top, so they create uh, another one. Uh, so while maybe we, uh, what we see now is uh, we could have maybe worked together to make sure that AI on Postgres is a real thing, uh, we see a lot of different AI-related uh, uh, extensions uh, because we all, we all, again, want to win. Uh, then also for an extension developer, there's not really a way to understand how your extension is being uh, used um, and what kind of value it provides, uh, except of course when there's people in your issues complaining about all the things that, it, that it's not doing. Um, also yesterday, if you were, uh, were in the session, um, if your extension is uh, depending on the hook, of course, with every release, you'll need to make sure that, uh, that all the functionality stays the same. Uh, and basically, the more of core that you're, you're touching, uh, the more worried you should be with every release that is coming up. Uh, if you were in uh, Nizelia's uh, presentation about keeping your extension uh, in step with the Postgres version, uh, you might want to think twice about releasing something uh, uh, of an extension if you're going at it solo. 
because uh, if you need to follow commits uh, that are going into a release and sort of like building and running tests against that uh, regularly to make sure that you spot issues early on, uh, that is a lot of work, especially if you have to do that next to your day job. Um, Citus, of course, uh, the, that was the use case, uh, has a lot of support, has Microsoft backing it, and they can easily dedicate some resources to it, but if you're, again, if you're going, it, going at it solo, that might be a lot harder. Right, so that is all hard stuff, and there's more hard stuff to come, because uh, the Cyber Resilience Act is coming for us all as well. Um, so the sort of TLDR, which is, a, which is a really good thing in my opinion, is that uh, manufacturers need to do decent security. That's, that's basically what it is. So yeah, everybody needs to test and triage and fix and update and disclose. Uh, those are important things. It's uh, mandatory to consider the impacts of your work on human lives, like actual human lives. Um, and, and not just the part that sort of like actually has the impact, but the whole entire chain that sort of leads to the impact as well, uh, which uh, with, dependency mean, with dependencies means basically everything. Um, and that is difficult and it's going to be expensive, but not doing so means that you're doing business illegally, so you better have a, have a look at this, uh, this upcoming legislation as well. Um, it means also that if you, and now I'm speaking to company you, if a company finds a vulnerability in a piece of open source that they're using, they can no longer uh, slide into a maintainer's issues and be like, fix this. Uh, they need to fix it. Uh, they can't just fix it in their cloud solution and offer it to their customers only. They have a responsibility to fix it upstream. Um, so we're, we're, when I said before, you know, like it's no free lunch, but, uh, but the wrong people bore the cost, we're going Dutch on, on open source now. Um, CRA borrows very, very heavily uh, from existing standards, so think uh, ISO or OWASP, if you're, if you're familiar with those, you're probably, uh, you're probably pretty good, right? Um, there is a new economic class that is uh, introduced with this CRA that's called uh, Open Source Steward. Uh, that maps pretty pretty closely to uh, software foundations. Um, so I think we're, we're, we'll be seeing a lot of manufacturers, uh, like both larger companies, but also uh, the maintainer that is now also a manufacturer, even if you don't think so, uh, joining foundations as well because they might have resources that they can share uh, with all of their projects. Um, now, if you're a project management uh, committee of one or two or three, but the other ones are just not very active because they have other stuff in their life going on, uh, you can probably not meet the requirements of the CRA. Uh, and you, you need to know that. Like you, you'll be very irresponsible if you're placing your project uh, on the marketplace. Um, what means putting it on the marketplace? And this definition is T TBD, and it is my definition, so please don't, don't take my word for it because I'm not a lawyer. But uh, cro crossing sort of that threshold is probably having a make file, uh, making your uh, software available through package managers, uh, writing release notes, etc. Like basically everything that signals that this is a healthy project that people can use in production. Uh, so make sure that if it's just a hobby project that you just dumped on GitHub, make very, 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 very sure that it says that it's a hobby project that you just put on GitHub. All right, so what do we need? When do we need it? So despite uh, us all celebrating you know, the extensibility of uh, Postgres as such a wonderful thing, uh, extension developers are uh, not recognized as Postgres hackers. That's a very exclusive term uh, that comes with very exclusive benefits, right? Um, contributors get listed uh, on that, uh, that, that one website. Uh, they get a bio, and maybe that bio, and I'm prefixing something, maybe that bio uh, contains, uh, if the maintainer also does a extension, it will probably say that before you go to postgres.org uh, community uh, contributors and say, well, actually, like, there's people here that also do extensions. Yes, but they do, they're not on that list because they do an extension. They go on that list because they contribute code. I know that there is some initiative going on to contribute more work, but uh, I mean, it's been like this for, for a while, has it not? All right, hackers have, uh, you know, get pretty uh, exclusive opportunities, right? Most of them get a, a room at these kind of events, might they want one, uh, then uh, trying to get a room for extension developers to come together at an event like this is, uh, is a bit harder, right? So they'd have to do it themselves. 
um, solo projects are not taken very seriously. Uh, they don't get the adoption uh, to become more visible and attracting more contributors to their projects. Uh, or if they gain that adoption, right, uh, that can kind of cause other uh, uh, you know, challenges again, because when they don't have succession planning uh, and the bus or lottery, whatever you know, your fancy factor hits, uh, or just the maintainer's priorities uh, shift, uh, then projects get abandoned or taken over, um, and that's causing people to say that extensions uh, might be a security threat. All right, so what do we need to do? Drink water. Yeah. Extension developers need to hydrate as well. All right, we need to increase uh, trust, we need to introduce governance, we need to uh, provide resources for these projects to secure that uh, they have a long-term uh, future and availability to the community. Um, they, again, they often lack uh, visibility um, and uh, they're, they're not necessarily ready for new co contributors. Uh, they could use help getting ready for new contributors. Uh, they could use some branding. I don't know if you've ever looked at the CNCF landscape, but every, every little project has a, has a logo and everything. Like they, they look like very serious projects too. Um, maybe some shared resources for testing and for, for CI, CD. Um, some level of um, standardization maybe uh, for, through uh, using frameworks or distribution platforms, uh, you know, like uh, operating system support. Uh, they could use some marketing uh, help, some licensing help, uh, you know, uh, copyright assistance. We're expecting these developers to do a lot of things that they, they don't know how to do themselves uh, when we could all be sharing resources instead. Um, so this is very much the start of a conversation, uh, and I hope that, the, you know, we have one more day left here, so this is the start of a conversation between us as well. Uh, three days ago here at the PGConf uh, um, conference, uh, we invited the community to an extension uh, 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 ecosystem summit um, following an unconference session at PGConf Dev in Vancouver earlier this year. Uh, we wanted to net, again connect with uh, other extension developers, users, and uh, allies, I guess, uh, for a working session. Uh, we had a couple of uh, developers presenting their projects. Uh, Jimmy presented PG Staffis. Uh, Adam here presented PGMQ, uh, Alistair in the room uh, 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 presented uh, PGTDE, uh, Gulchin presented PGZX, uh, and James uh, presented uh, PG Vector Skill and PGAI, uh, and also talked about PGRX a lot because he will talk about PGRX a lot, uh, always. Um, so the, the summit was supported by a couple of companies, really wonderful. I, I just started it at uh, Stembo, yeah, David and I started the Stembo and the other companies uh, uh, came on board, Percona, Xeda, and De Timescale uh, offered to uh, take a part of the bill, uh, which is wonderful because, you know, room, room uh, rent and catering, uh, you know, is expensive. Um, and, and really, the, the, the beginning of the day was uh, the, the developers presenting their, their project, and then the afternoon was really meant as a sort of a hackathon, making sure that projects find new contributors, uh, maybe rent with fellow extension developers about the challenges that they're facing and how difficult everything is, which is also important uh, to have to create that community feeling. Um, you can bet that next PGConf dev, next PGConf, there will be another one of these gatherings of extension peoples, as we've been called. Um, there is a link on the slide with a folder to all of the presentations, and I'll also be working on a summary to post shortly as well. Um, what else is happening? Um, just as, a, as a sort of like things that we're experimenting with at Tembo, uh, we've introduced bounties for two uh, projects, uh, two extension projects. Uh, so that's cash rewards for people successfully picking up issues uh, and contributing to these extensions. Uh, we participate in Hacktoberfest, uh, which is a month-long celebration of open source, if you're not aware. Um, and in 2023, 20, uh, uh, 98,000 people contributed to uh, Hacktoberfest labeled issues, which is pretty, pretty interesting. Um, pull requests on these projects count towards uh, people's Hectoberfest goal, which I think this year is planting a tree somewhere or whatever. That doesn't really matter. It's, it's getting more eyeballs uh, uh, on these projects and attract people with different skill sets to these projects. Um, we're very much uh, of the mindset that we should consolidate, consolidate and, and, and collaborate. Uh, ParadeDB is fantastic at search. Why would we uh, want to make something ourselves if we can work together with Parades? 
uh, for your open source document uh, database needs, there's FerritDB. Why not work together with FerritDB, which is exactly what we do as well. Um, so wherever we can, we will work together or figure out if we can, uh, can combine our efforts and work on one extension rather than all trying to win with our own single uh, uh, extension. All right, wrapping up, uh, David and I have been going around uh, this week talking uh, about a more professional community initiative to support uh, Postgres landscape uh, projects. So maybe you're in the room because we talked your ear off about it already. If we haven't, we're still around for a whole day. Uh, so definitely come talk to us uh, about what we're trying to do there. Um, that, that's David. But he's also wearing a face, face mask. So like, I should have like drawn it on it uh, so that you'd be more recognizable. Um, in any case, supporting extensions will be, will have to be a community effort, right? Um, and with upcoming legislations, I, I think we can't half arse this. So let's pull together uh, this time for real. Thank you very much. Incredible talk. Thanks so much, Floor. Uh, we can open it up for questions. I'm almost more of the like no no questions, more conversations, more conversations. over coffee. Over coffee, perfect. Then I do have a quick question. You do have a question. Oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> okay, it was just for me. Tell me. Um, so on one end, we're talking about exciting new extensions that maybe follow a similar foundation. For example, PG Vector, a lot of different extensions that might abstract away and use it. Um, do we know of any history or evidence of extensions being merged together? Um, for example, if something was added functionality to um, PG Vector and then PG Vector people reached out and said, okay, that's great, let's work together and merge it. You know, do we know, has it ever happened before? There's definitely uh, been, been instances where people are like, oh, our things do practically the same thing. Wouldn't it be smarter if we work together so that we don't ha all bo both have to work so hard on this? Um, so yeah, that ha has definitely happened, and I think that's a really, really good thing. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Then. Oh, no. Okay. Yes, yeah, sure. Yes, Boris. Now, so one of the strong points of um, Postgres is that nobody owns it. No company owns Postgres, so you cannot buy Postgres. But it's, for the case of extensions, even though the license can be open source, there's most of the time a company owning this stuff. Isn't that a risk for all the first stories that you mentioned that somebody could just change the license of their extension? Yes. Yeah, that's what I'm afraid of. You know, like that there, there will be a little bit of that rock pulling, and then you've put all of your eggs in the in the, the that one that one extension, and then if the if it's a single vendor owning the extension, uh, that could definitely be a problem. Um, the only way to go, you know, to change that is to make sure that if you're doing your due diligence of the extensions that you want to use, make sure that it's not backed by a single vendor, but that there's a community behind it. But again, that is difficult if uh, if most extensions are developed by a single uh, individual. Any other questions? Do you want to clarify here something? Here in the front. Boris no? or Evan. Ah, here. And so we also had that thing uh, with an extension called Multicon, yeah. which is uh, a very cool thing, or has been a very cool thing. That's uh, how I started to use an extension, except of PostGIS, of course. <laughs> and because you could develop with Python extensions that are based on that thing, and it makes life easier. You have an API, but then the company went bankrupt whatsoever, and the product got abandoned. Yeah. So now there is a Multicon 2 extension, which is now done by a community. That is also an example yes. how things can happen. But there haven't been updates on Multicon for several Postgres versions until it has been taken over. Yeah. But the, and, but the new version is now community-owned. The, the new version is community-owned, yeah. company-owned, and... Uh, is also nowadays uh, very fast in supporting new Postgres versions. Cool. Thank you. So the um, 
things that you're identifying as ways to better support extensions, uh, bounties, and Hacktoberfest are both really GitHub-centric. And I'm curious, you know, you've got to kind of meet the monoculture where it is, but are you looking at any uh, avenues for doing this that aren't really dependent on GitHub as a platform? Um, yeah, so like I, I mentioned those as experience because that's what we were doing at Timbo and our, and our extensions live on GitHub, right? So like uh, that, that's a very easy thing for us to do. Uh, of course, extensions live everywhere, you know, uh, that's, uh, that is a bit of a part of the sort of like Wild Wild West. We don't really know how many extensions there are uh, because they can be hosted anywhere. Uh, th those were just two examples of like we own those or, sorry, we started those two like, oh, I said the word own, did you hear me? Uh, and then I and then I repeated it too. Uh, anyway, we started those two projects, and they are up on, on GitHub. So we have that uh, uh, you know, like that option to our. Uh, yeah, we have that option. Uh, you can do that for for uh, projects that are hosted on GitLab as well. Um, and it would have been it would maybe be a strange thing if we uh, gave out money for people to work on projects that we ne haven't really started. Uh, that would be would have to be sort of like a discussion with other people that you develop an extension with. So these are very like very much like that. This is what we can do as a as a company. Uh, but yeah, I mean, why, why not? Like, why? Uh, I, I think it would be great if more extension developers would come together and share stories of like, hey, we used Hectoberfest to get a couple of more eyeballs on our extension. It worked really well for us, or it didn't work for us, and share that experience. And then maybe other extension developers can go like, oh, maybe, maybe next year, uh, you know, in September, I can make sure that there is a couple of uh, issues that are labeled as uh, good for first issues for new contributors to the project to pick up something that they can pick up without having a lot of knowledge of the uh, of the extension itself or uh, if you're particularly looking for for something very specific like you want to have uh, I think we have for one of the extensions we have uh, um, the the a bounty for writing install guides for different uh, for different operating systems as well um, so not only f looking for code contributions but also uh, additions to docs or uh, maybe you want to, uh, to see if the community come, can come up with a logo like there there is no end to what you can can ask for uh, during Hectoberfest either uh, when it comes to interoperability or uh, uh, having multiple extensions running at the same time who's taking this incentive or is there any efforts or what can we do as developers or Postgres hackers to make sure there's a centralized process that uh, few extensions are not colliding each other or they're compatible with, with each other. Any, any I, strategy for that? I feel like if I answer that, I get really, really commercial and be like, oh, come to the Tempo booth because we ship Postgres with extensions for your use case. But I don't, I don't know if that's very useful. Maybe we can have this conversation yeah. a little bit later. Hi. Just would like to comment on this, what you said before about uh, having multiple extensions that do the same thing, trying to converge them, and I think that's certainly a situation sometimes that pe many people have the same idea or this, at the same time and start basically differently, like the AI, I think, extension that you mentioned is such a case, but I think also there, are, we can see cases where it's different. We have multiple extensions just because there's, the collaboration is not easy. I think with PG Vector, right, I think that's one observation that I made that as the uh, the, the Rust extension that we also have is the pgvector.rs. And when I talked to those guys, they said, oh, yeah, our PRs were just ignored. So we started our own thing. So do we have any thoughts of what can be done to foster a more collaborative nature here so that those don't things up a design, basically, multiple extensions, and we have a hard time to pick and choose? Yeah, no, I see what you mean. Of course, like there, it's it's only the uh, you know the, there's only so much you can do, and as long as the intention is to work together, uh, that is a good thing. Of course, it's not always accepted. That is that you know like that will always be the case. There is always going to be the case that that people don't want to work together. Um, unfortunately, like we're all we're all humans, and some humans are nicer than other humans. Uh, but as long as you know like the, at least at least try, uh, I do th feel like there is a, there is very little platforms for extension developers to talk to each other uh, and and hoping through like things like the extension summit to uh, to change that so that people can come together uh, maybe there can be a, a slack channel to make sure that people know each other a little bit better I think a, a part of that is just fear you don't know each other very well yet you don't know the other person's intentions uh, but uh, but as long as collaboration is the 
uh, ambition, uh, that's, that's all you can do, unfortunately. Uh, can't forge people to be nice and accepting of others. The last que question here. So you mentioned this uh, idea of basically sustainability. We also need some, basically, we need some resources, some money and all that. And for example, um, Google has been using uh, code I wrote. I never got paid by Google, but it's fine. It's an open source license. But is there any way how we can motivate uh, bigger actors, like for example, Google or Amazon, to have basically an open fund to just you know, spend one tenth of one tenth of a percent of their profit on open source, and most of us could retire. <laughs> Wait, it doesn't solve the problem. But I mean, yeah. these big companies they have basically infinite resources, and they're unwilling to give uh, people who are the maintainers even you know, a small token of appreciation. Can we fix that? So, uh, having worked for one of the, the bigger companies that you also uh, mentioned, uh, there is a lot of initiatives, right? Like they, they do give you like, a, uh, there, there's open source plans for a lot of things and uh, for, for nonprofit organizations, there's, there's resources available. Uh, Microsoft has a FOSS fund. I think they, they award 10, 10K to a project every uh, so many months. So uh, there's definitely, pro you know, like, and of course 10K is not the, the, the percentage you're, you're looking for uh, to get from, from Microsoft maybe, but there's definitely initiatives to give money uh, to, to open source projects. Um, of course, like these, uh, the FOSS funds are, are really, really, Cool, but that's again not not very sustainable, right? Because you get that award at once, uh, and then the next month you have zero again. Uh, so it is maybe not incredibly helpful uh, for for projects. Some projects also don't have any way to accept those funds um, because they're not set up that way, right? Because again, they're like just a solo solo developer. Um, so they there are absolute there's absolutely uh, initiatives out there for for from cloud vendors also and bigger companies to uh, contribute to open source, but they're, they're in no way very, very sustainable. I don't think so. Awesome, so thank you so much once more, Flor, for Thank the wonderful you. talk and wonderful discussion afterwards.